All right, it's the 18th of November, 2022, and if you're recalling my previous video from last week, I'd mentioned that the snow was coming, and the snow has arrived, unfortunately. Enough to shovel. Uh, this was from a couple days ago. Anyway, it's uh, definitely cold and snowy. It's an early start to winter here. I was hoping the snow would hold off for another few weeks, but that is not the case. Anyway, we'll button the garage up, get the heater going, and figure out what we're going to do on the 59 Triumph TR3A project. Alright, I suspect the uh, next group of videos that I'm going to be doing is not going to be of too much interest to a lot of you that uh, view my videos on a regular basis. Uh, they are primarily going to be me digging through parts bins and picking out small projects to work on. For example, I've got the um, pedal box here and the blanking plate and the clutch and brake master cylinder box here on the floor. We've got the bumper overrider. So what I'm planning on doing is I'm planning on doing a lot of the small components over the winter months. So um, that is going to be the direction I'm going to take. It all has to be done at some point anyway. Uh, when it comes to starting to assemble the car, things will go along much more quickly. And that's kind of the exciting part that you all like to watch. You don't like to necessarily watch the down and dirty uh, stuff of me cleaning prepping, painting, restoring all of the small parts. But it's something that I've got to do and something I'm going to document. So maybe for the die-hard uh, side screen owners out there, they might want to watch me do this, but I understand if the videos get fewer views because it's not really an exciting topic for a lot of you to watch. Regardless of that, like I'd mentioned, I'm going to go ahead and do it. So we've started to go through the bins and dig out parts that we need to refinish or work on over the winter months. I can't really do any major painting of panels out here, for example, if I had body panels and I wanted to do body work and painting. It's really not the time of the year to be doing that. It's too cold in the garage to do that. And I have another vehicle or potentially a couple of vehicles in the garage at the same time, so I'm not going to be able to do any large-scale painting projects in here either. So that's why I've decided really to spend most of this winter working on smaller projects or smaller components of the car. So. When the weather does get nicer, we can then move back to the bodywork and painting of body panels and assembling of the car, which will hopefully go quicker in the end, as mentioned, because we'll have all the smaller components done. So that's what the plan uh, is for the next few months on this car, is to do as many small projects as I can. I'm sorry. All right, having said that, the focus over the uh, next couple of days will be to go through all of the bins that I've uh, dug out of storage and brought into the garage here. I mentioned in my last video that we've stored all of the uh, backup or, or leftover parts from the uh, TR250 project and we've brought out all the TR3A parts bins to go through. I do have uh, some extra parts involved in some of these bins um, because I did actually have a TR3, a 1960 TR3 parts car at one point so we do have some duplicates to go through and of course we'll pick the best of what I have as far as duplicates are concerned. This pedal box, I'm not sure which car this came out of, but uh, anyway, there is another pedal box around and I think it's got a bit of a twist in it because the parts car I purchased actually was in quite a significant accident and some of the parts are unusable um, because they may be bent or twisted uh, beyond uh, use. But anyway, we'll go through the bins, we'll figure out what we're going to use and what we're going to restore over the winter months and uh, I'll lay them out here on the floor of the garage probably in some <clears throat> groupings that make sense to me. We may uh, actually start storing them away in bins and have bins of projects we want to work on over the winter and then bins we want to leave until a later point in time. All right, so that's the focus of the next few days is to go through the bins. All right, guys, it's Saturday. We uh, did go through the bins and do a little bit of organization. For example, this one here is all my carburetor related kind of stuff or fuel related, let's say. You see an old sending unit there or an old float sticking out. Anyway, uh, we did manage to empty a couple of bins and uh, we've managed to pick a few parts here and there that we're going to refinish over the next uh, little while uh, here and here. And uh, I also have some parts inside that I thought I would dig out and play around with. And in particular, we're gonna be looking at this uh, center gauge cluster or this little piece of metal here that holds the gauges in the cluster on the TR3. Actually from all the side screen cars from the TR2 to the TR3B had this kind of uh, cluster in the center. 
we'll have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So I thought we'd do a little bit of a project today to refinish this uh, center gauge cluster or mount or whatever we're going to call it. Let's call it a mount. And uh, normally these, uh, or for the later cars at least, these were uh, finished normally in a black a wrinkle paint. And I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see some remnants of that wrinkle finish on this panel. It's seen better days. I believe the earlier cars, like the TR2s, and I'm not sure when they stopped, but I believe the earlier cars were actually wrapped in uh, either leather, leather or vinyl matching the actual uh, color of the dash, which would be wrapped in leather or, or vinyl as well. Most likely vinyl, I think, was the non-option with leather being the option. Regardless, it should be black wrinkle paint uh, for my car, and I think I want to do something a little bit different as per my uh, will. Uh, I'm thinking I'm going to try a hand at doing some engine turning. I thought this might look good in the car engine turned and clear coated uh, so it'll be nice and shiny and obviously once the gauges go back in I think it'll look pretty good. It is going with a red interior so I thought that engine turning would look nice against a red dash on either side. So we'll let you be the judge, it doesn't really matter <laughs> I guess. but. That is what I'm going to do, or I'm going to attempt to do. I've never done any engine turning before. And I know there's a particular process and particular tools that you should use to do this. So I'm going to attempt to do something a little bit different with what I have on hand. If it doesn't work out, I can always go back and redo it. So we're going to attempt to engine turn today, let's say. And I'll take you along the way. So I think engine turning is normally done on aluminum. This is obviously not aluminum. Well, maybe not obvious to some of you, but it is actually made of steel. So this might not work at all. But well, like I said, we're going to attempt it. So that's the first thing to do is to actually clean off the old black wrinkle finish and get this back down to bare shiny metal. So that's the first step that we're gonna do as far as cleaning this up to get ready for the actual engine turning process. So I'm gonna pull out the angle grinder and uh, we're gonna scrub this down. I might bring out the DA sander. We don't wanna make this too coarse of a finish below. We want it to be fairly smooth. So we don't wanna go too uh, heavy on the grit to get this paint off. We do want it to be nice and shiny before we start that engine turning process. All right, there is that panel all cleaned up. What we did is we just hit it with um, this little flap disc, which is kind of a fiber flap disc. It's not sandpaper. It's more of a kind of a scotch bright material. As you can see, it's, uh, I guess, 120 grit. So it's not overly scratchy. But I think it did a fairly good job. I might have to go a little bit finer. So I might have to get the DA out with some like 400 grit sandpaper on here. But again, this is going to be a bit of a trial and error for me as I've never done it before. But I think we're going to try it just with this finish and see how things turn out. So. On to the next step, which is trying to figure out how to actually get um, the engine turning done with the tools that I have. We'll talk about it, a bit more about that in just a second. Now, this might not turn out very well um, for the first attempt. A, because I'm not using any sort of fixture uh, to hold this piece other than my vise. So, normally when you're doing a piece, you would have it in a fixture, like on a drill press, for example, or on a milling machine and you would actually move the fixture along with a piece attached to it. Well, I'm going to try to do this by hand, first of all. Second of all, normally you would use uh, something like it's called a Kratex stick, which is a rubberized stick that's impregnated with an abrasive. So you normally use something like a brown uh, Kratex stick uh, to do this, and you just put it in the drill press and have a fixture for that in the press, and then you just push down on the drill press, move the, move the, um, the fixture, and then push down again. So I don't have the ability to do that here. I did call Elaine yesterday and say, can I use your drill press uh, possibly today? Um, but I thought, well, I might as well just attempt to try to do this first here at home before I bother Elaine and go all the way down there to use his drill press. So I thought I would try to freehand this first and see how it turns out. You never know, I might be happy with it in the end. Now let's talk about what I'm gonna use to make the engine turning details. So as mentioned, most people will use this round Kratex stick to do the uh, engine turning detail. And those sticks can be uh, purchased in different diameters. So if you wanted a, l a larger or smaller uh, pattern, you could get it based off the size of Kratex stick that you ordered. A lot of people will also do something like a piece of dowel. For example, I've got a piece of wooden dowel here at the back here. So I've seen people actually use wooden dowels and turn it down enough on the one end so it'll actually fit in the drill. 
And then what they would do is uh, stick a piece of Scotch-Brite pad around Scotch-Brite pad or a trimmed around Scotch-Brite pad and use that as the fixture in the drill press and push down until the Scotch-Brite hit the surface and made an impression. Well, I'm not going to do that initially. What I'm going to try is with these little sanding uh, discs. Now these are, again, sort of a Scotch-Brite material. They're about the right diameter. So what I'm going to try to do and see if these will actually leave the impression that I'm looking for. I'm going to use my Dremel straight up and down, either my Dremel or my drill. Uh, probably be better with my drill, but we'll, uh, we'll figure that out as well. So the idea is to go ahead and use these little uh, red scotch bright ones. There are different colors in here based on different abrasives, but I think the red is what we're going to attempt to work with. And that will make the pattern going down and across. And of course there's a certain way that this pattern needs to, it needs to be slightly overlapping this way. And then when you come back, you've got to sort of start, I think, the pattern kind of in the middle of where the circular pattern leaves off. Anyway, I'll show you that, or I'll hopefully show you that after I do a few trials here. All right, not sure how well you're gonna be able to see this. So here's the kind of pattern that I'm going for. The only problem I'm finding is that the metal depression in this pad is a little bit, uh, pronounced so you get a little bit of a dimple in each of the um, areas if I put too much pressure on this so that is probably going to be problematic so maybe what I'll try to do is I'll clear this back up we'll go back through and we'll apply less pressure than what we're applying currently but that's the kind of idea that I'm going for but uh, anyway let's clear that off and uh, we'll go back through and apply less pressure and see if we can get rid of that dimpling in the middle.
All right, that's what it looks like. Once that process is completed, <coughs> I don't think it looks too bad. Let me clean it off and we'll have a little bit better look. All right, guys, again, for a first attempt, I think it actually looks pretty good. So I think what we're gonna do is maybe go on to the next step, which will be clear coating this. Again, if we don't like it in the end, we can always strip it back off and uh, attempt to do it again. But I'll be interested to see what this looks like with the clear coat on. Again, this is gonna be going into a uh, red dashed car. So actually it'll be going this way. This is the bottom, that is the top. So I think that might be okay actually. Once we get some clear on it, we'll get the clear uh, sanded down and polished. And uh, hopefully that will pick up a little bit of the uh, re reflectivity in the light. But I think that might be good. So let's move on to the next step and we'll break the clear coat out. All right, just popped out to shut the garage down for the night. We've got three coats of clear coat on the uh, dash panel. So we'll take a look at this tomorrow once it's had a chance to dry. I think I'll move it inside. It'll be a little warmer in there overnight, but it's uh, looking pretty good. We did manage to get the garage up to uh, almost 70 degrees with the little uh, heater on out here. Still haven't insulated, so that's pretty good for that little, little heater. I can see the hydrometer spinning round and round though. So anyway, let's grab this, we'll put it inside and uh, we'll have a look at it tomorrow. And uh, eventually we'll probably do a little wet sanding and polishing on it just to uh, get it to shine up a bit better. All right, that's it for now. All right guys, we are in the house today uh, doing an indoor project. We're gonna try to uh, clean up some gauges and switch gear to put back in this center cluster. Uh, some of the um, the knobs, for example, might be exchanged in the future because I don't have new knobs. I'm just going to work with what I have in uh, house currently, um, so they won't be the best. But uh, what I'm planning on doing is taking the gauges apart, cleaning up the faces, and putting them back in this cluster. Now, I do have the original dash out of my 59 here just in front of me on display. And uh, you can see the original cluster there that's got the black wrinkle finish, as it should be and a couple of the gauges still in there. The temperature gauge actually I had actually used in my 60 project when I had a problem with the uh, temperature gauge failing prior to my uh, Triumph Register of America trip. Um, so I had to use the old gauge out of this dash and it actually worked surprisingly. So we're short a temperature gauge, although I have the gauge over there that I'm just gonna put in here, although it's not functioning we need to get a new temperature gauge. But uh, we have a few spare gauges to work with, so we're gonna take the best of what we have and clean those up, and we're going to install them back in this cluster just to see what it looks like. Uh, you know, it's kind of a project that's kind of a fun project to do, so we'll get started by cleaning up some gauges, and uh, we'll clean up the uh, switch gear, which I have here. Basically, all of the, uh, all of the switches here already bagged and tagged and uh, some of the lights here for examples and the bezels. I've got some polish to polish those up. I've got the original set of keys, the ignition tumbler. So we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and use all these old components like I'd mentioned. Some of them may be switched out in the future like these old knobs. I might actually try to fix them up and maybe uh, clean them up a little bit but uh, they won't be as good as new. So we'll see what we can do as far as cleaning those up uh, but I'm not holding my breath. Anyway, let's get busy and uh, clean up some gauges. All right, just taking a quick look at the uh, spare gauges that I have. So we've got three oil uh, gauges. I've got two amp gauges. One is a flat glass though, which is a later uh, TR4 gauge. It's the flat glass one. And we have the dome glass, which is correct for the uh, TR3. So we'll uh, maybe, I think I like this actual gauge better. I like the, uh, the push on connectors at the back of this better. I think this is a later gauge. Uh, with the uh, screw-on connectors. I'm not actually sure, but uh, anyway, I think I like this one better, so we may clean this one up. And we have one spare fuel gauge, so we'll go ahead and we'll clean that up and uh, use that along with the temperature gauge. So there are the gauges that we're going to work with, so probably we'll use this guy here. We'll probably use, uh, as mentioned, this guy here. We'll switch out the bezel and the um, and the curved glass, and then we'll probably use, obviously I only have one option for the fuel gauge, so we'll go ahead and use that. We'll put these aside for another use at a later date. All right, we're just about to start uh, disassembling the amp uh, gauges, and uh, there are these little tabs here on the back that you basically need to 
unpin, uh, and you should be able to take the uh, gauge out carefully. Um, you just have to be very careful of the movements uh, of the needles in here, how the uh, face comes off, because um, they're easily bent. This one actually looks like it's been bent previously. Um, but anyway, we're just going to exchange the glass on these two and clean the face up. So that's basically how you do that, just by re by pulling these tabs back with a small screwdriver. I've got a little uh, little hammer here if need be as well, but we'll just carefully unpin these and uh, we'll switch out the glass on this one and clean the face while we're at it. All right, we have the two amp gauges assembled into their individual components. And again, there's the curved glass versus the flat glass. So we basically want to transfer the curved glass. We're going to use the best components of the two. So we're probably going to use this face a little bit better than this face, this glass, and then we'll figure out the rest of the components. We'll probably use this uh, backing here. I kind of like the way the copper wire is uh, in twisted inside this one versus this one, which looks like it may have had a repair in the past, this little shunt wire. This one looks a little bit more factory. So I think we're going to go with this one. So we'll clean up the dial on this one, we'll clean up the face, and we'll clean up the rest of the components the best we can. Generally what I do to uh, clean the faces up, I just use a little bit of pledge on a Q-tip to clean those up and to shine those up. That's what I've been doing in the past, or what I've done in the past for all of my restorations, and that seems to have held up pretty well. So that's what we're going to continue to do. So anyway, we'll get this uh, gauge cleaned up and the components picked out, and we'll get it back together and we'll move on to the next gauge. All right, a quick look at the uh, first gauge cleaned up and just uh, placed in its slot. So we'll work on the next one, which will be the uh, fuel gauge and the oil gauge, and we'll get those installed, and we'll come back. All right, the gauges have been completed. We'll have a little bit of a better look at those uh, once they're installed back in the cluster. What we're going to work on now are the rest of the components of the uh, cluster. So the lights, for example, and all the switch gear, we're going to go through that. I've got... Uh, basically spares of all the switch gear here and some spare lights and bezels here as well. So we're going to go ahead and work on cleaning these up and uh, doing a little bit of metal polishing on the bezels to get them looking a little bit better. Again, I'm not sure what I'll be able to do with the switches that I have. Uh, some of them are pretty far gone. So you can see here, for example, there's not much of paint uh, left in there. I might be able to clean this up a little bit and Try a little, uh, try to rub a little bit of paint in there, but we'll see. Again, these are available new, so I'm not too worried about it. these. Can be replaced later. It's just a, a simple push uh, button release. There's a little uh, button that you push in on. I don't know if you can see it there. You just basically depress that, and the knob will come off. So, anyway, we'll worry about that in a little bit. Let me start working on these uh, lights and bezels first, and we'll come back. All right. So all I'm doing for these buttons is I'm cleaning them up as best as possible with a little bit of. Uh, Windex to get them nice and clean. Then I'm hitting them with a little bit of uh, liquid paper here to sort of fill in the depressions. Now the starter button is the one that's probably got the most wear on it because it gets the most uh, action uh, being pressed every time it starts the car. So the uh, embossment of it is probably the shallowest, but uh, this generally works a little bit if you can rub some liquid paper in or some enamel paint for that matter and then just rub it off quickly. Usually some paint will stay within the depressions of the letters. Anyway, we'll give that a shot and we'll see what that looks like when we're uh, when it's dried. All right, we're making pretty good uh, progress here. We have all the uh, switch gear in now, and I did have to borrow a few items from uh, the 59 dash over here, and we just transferred them over here. You can see I've got a combination of new knobs. There's a new, uh, I don't know if you can see that very well. It's getting a little dark in here. A new knob versus the, uh, there's another new knob there, and here's the one where I just wiped a little bit of paint in. Those ones came out not too bad, but the starter button, as I'd mentioned, was going to be the worst of it because it had so much wear on it. But these uh, two were recovered not too badly, so anyway, we're going to replace them all. Uh, they come as a package, those switches, so we'll do that when, uh, when I get the order in for those. Anyway, let's uh, stick the gauges in and see what those look like. All right, just wanted to make a quick ending video of the finished gauge cluster. Well, not really finished. Uh, there are a few things I'll mention right off the top before anybody wants to point it out. Uh, a couple of the gauges are in the wrong place. I, I understand that. I just put this together temporarily. So these two gauges, for example, are temperature is lower, oil is higher, 
and I believe these two switches are reversed as well. So the wiper switch goes up the top, the panel switch goes in the middle. That's my understanding. Again, this is going to come apart before it goes in the car, but I just wanted to put something together so you guys could get an idea what this will look like once it's, uh, once it's fully assembled and in the car. You get an idea of what that finish looks like now with the engine turning and with all the uh, knobs and uh, gauges in place. I think it looks pretty good. I'm happy with that little project. Again, it's going to be on a red uh, dash background, so I think that will be uh, quite striking actually. Anyway, that's the uh, engine turning on the uh, center gauge cluster, and uh, again, it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea, but it's something a little bit different, and uh, as you know, I like to make, or I like to put my personal touch on the car, so that's going to work for me. Thanks very much for watching, thanks for commenting, and thanks for subscribing. We'll see you on the next little project.